The Great Controversy, Chapter 3, An Era of Spiritual Darkness. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, foretold the great apostasy which would result in the establishment of the papal power. He declared that the day of Christ should not come except there come a fall away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, 4, and 7. You see, little by little, at first instilleth in silence, and then more openly as it increases in strength and gain control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased and, and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of king, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp pride of pagan priests and rulers and in place the requirements of God she substitute human theories and traditions how well as we mentioned before it's all about the doctrines and in this case we see the doctrines and ceremonies of men placed above the doctrines and the commandments of God for instance the Pope, being the visible head of the universe of the universal church, in their in their in their authority, they believe that they are above the authority of any bishop, pastors in all parts of the world, regardless of their religion. Whereas in the Bible, in Ephesians chapter five, verse twenty-three, the Bible tells us that Christ is the head of the church and no man. You see, the Pope. Uh, gives himself the authority or, or, or the, the, the title of Lord God the Pope, infallible, meaning that as a human being, he cannot make mistakes. Friends, the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, God tells us, You shall have no other gods before me. And the Bible is clear, it says that all men have seen and all have come short of the glory of God. In other words, no man on earth is infallible. You see, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church has removed the second commandment and split the last in two. You see, the second commandment is the most important one in regards to this big contrast because it says, You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under, uh, um, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, pay attention, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers, of the fathers upon the children, to the third and fourth generation of those that hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. That is Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. It is clear from the word of God that we are not to bow down to, to, to idols and worship them, to make any image and, 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 and call it a God or, 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 or a saint or anything that you know people call it out there and worship it. To the worship um, uh, of idols, the adoration of saints, and images and relics, Friends, this is nothing from the Word of God. And sadly, in the in the Catholic Church, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, this commandment has been removed. And the last one, the tenth commandment, tenth commandment has been split in two. Another, another, another doctrine that we're looking here is, is the 
introduction of a new day of worship, Sunday, and then force its observance. The Bible is clear in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the day of your Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your, nor your stranger who, who is in within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Friends, this commandment too has been reduced within the Roman Catholic Church Bible. But most important than that, friend, you see, many of us today believe in and think that Sunday is a day of worship. When you go back into history and the scriptures, you come to see that the early Christians, they all observed the Sabbath. It was in slow introduction to the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus on a Sunday that some Christians started to take that too as a day of celebration at first but then we turn because the Jewish had loaded upon the people the burdens of the idea of what the Sabbath should be whereas the Sunday was a day of recreation in celebration of Jesus resurrection and so with time, with time, people started enjoying more the worship or the celebration of Sunday over the, 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 the observance of the Sabbath. Sadly, Satan used that avenue to, 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 to pull people away from God's holy day of worship, holy day of rest. And with time, many people started worshiping more on Sunday than on the true Sabbath, Saturday. And this is how today we now have the worship of Sunday. But it's not just because people enjoyed more one day over another, but it is also because over time it became enforced by the Roman Catholic Church that Sunday had to be observed as the day of worship. First by Constantine, himself. Then the Roman Catholic Church took it upon themselves to make it their authority. Another part of the doctrine is the consciousness in death, purgatory. By such means did Roman fill her coffers and sustain the magnificent luxury and vice, the pretended representative of him who had not where to lay his head. In other words, friends, the Roman church had filled itself with so much money, convincing people that it is a place called purgatory where they can pray for the loved ones who have passed away and move them to heaven from one place to heaven, from hell to purgatory, from purgatory to heaven. Friends, there is no such word purgatory at all in the Bible. And the Bible is clear about the state of the dead. You see, we read in Ecclesiastes 9, uh, 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 verse 5 to 7 it says for the living know that they will die but the dead know nothing and they have no more reward for the memory of them is forgotten also their love their hatred their envy have now perished nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun in other words friends once the dead are gone they're gone there's no coming back here on earth to do anything except when the Son of Man returns. As you will read for yourself in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 17, what will happen to the dead at that time. And so indeed, friends, there is no such a thing as roaming spirits of our loved people who have passed away. Lastly, the bread and wine, which in Roman Catholic Church, it is said that we are 
literally drinking the blood of Jesus and literally eating the body of Jesus, which refers to, first of all, recreation of the body of Christ. In other words, mean that the Roman Catholic Church has power to recreate. We as human beings have power to recreate. And also refers to cannibalism. Friends, the Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter two, uh, verse, verse 23 to, to 26, it tells us to do this, to, to have the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Christ. And he says, verse, verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread, not his body, not his literal physical body, the bread itself, and drink this cup, not, in, not the literal blood of Jesus Christ, but a symbolic wine that represents that, a symbolic bread that represents his body. It says, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Friends, it is symbolic, but not literal. You see, friends, Satan wants endeavored to form a compromise with Christ. He came to the Son of God in the wilderness temptation of temptation and, and, and showing him all the kingdoms of the world and, and, and the glory of them. He offered to give all into his hands if he would but acknowledge the supremacy of the Prince of Darkness. Christ rebuked the presumptuous tempter and forced him to depart. But Satan met with greater success in presenting the same temptation to man to secure worldly gains and honors the church was led to seek the favor and support of the great man of earth and having thus rejected Christ she was induced to yield allegiance to the representative of Satan the Bishop of Rome you see, in order for Satan to maintain his sway over man and establish the authority of papal usurper, he must keep them in ignorance of the scriptures. For hundreds of years, the, the circulation of the Bible was prohibited. Hence, the era, the era of spiritual darkness. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established in its seats of power. And I began the 126 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecy of Daniel and Revelation. Christians were forced to choose either to yield their integrity and accept the papal ceremonies and, and worship or to wear a way to wear away their lives in dungeons or suffer death by the wreck, the faggot, or the headsman's axe. Thus says the prophets, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her. Therefore, a thousand Two hundred and three score days. Says Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. Instead of trusting the Son of God for forgiveness of sins and for eternal salvation, the people looked to the Pope and to the priests and prelates to whom he delegates authority. They were told that the Pope was the earthly mediator and that none could approach God except through him and further that he stood in the place of God friends Jesus Christ tells us himself that no man comes to the Father except through me in other words except through him Jesus Christ himself and so we do not need any other person friends to, to, to stand for us, to plead for us, except Christ himself, who has total access to the Father. And we have total access to Christ himself. 
not through other men, not through a statute, not through um, a particular prayer, but in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Christ himself. And so the question comes to us again, where is Jesus in this time? Where is Jesus during, during these parts of the Christian history? Where is Jesus? Friend, Jesus is the one who centuries before the fulfillment of, of this time declared through the Apostle Paul that he would not come except there come a follower first. And that, the, the, that that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and sits and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, whereas he is not. You see, only a true God can foretell these things, and they will come to happen. They will come to pass. As it says, it is an era of spiritual darkness, meaning that prior to, to this, there must have been light, which none other than the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which warned men about the, this apostasy, which in this part of the great controversy is under attack. God's word. Friend, Jesus is with those who have chosen and have kept the spiritual light himself, the spiritual life, Christ himself, prior to this era, which means that Christ, the light of the world, provides light even in times of spiritual darkness. As he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8 verse 12. Friend, Jesus is the light in, in the darkness, guiding us back to truth uh, through, through his word in Luke 4. As it says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Not a man, not an entity, not a system, not a church, not an organization, not a statue, for it is written. In Exodus 20, 4 to 5, it says, You shall have, you shall, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. Friends, Jesus is the one in the midst of the dark ages saying, to his faithful ones what I say unto you I say unto all watch and be not afraid of them remember the Lord which is great and terrible in other words most powerful most most honorable greater and mightier than any living being in the universe. Friends, Jesus is that angel of God in the midst of evil counsels, unseen by the enemy, taking the fearful record of the iniquitous decrees and writing the history of the deeds to a horrible to appear to human eyes, to be rightly judged at the time of his coming. You may wonder and ask yourself once again, why should I care? Why should I care about all this? Friends, Luke 21, 16 to 17 tells us, ye shall be betrayed you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Friends, 
Christ is telling us once again here that when you love God and you practice love, the principles of love, of put, which is to put others before you, friends, when you practice those principles, which is the exact ref reflection of God's character Himself, Christ is telling us that the world filled with evil will not accept that will not be happy of it yes perhaps some will accept yes perhaps some will enjoy that but the more light is shed the more of your the more of the holiness that covers you reflects their scene and so your presence is not welcome around them hence the hatred builds on you And so he's telling us ahead of time that when we practice that love, this persecution will come just as it came for those in the first centuries. So why should you care? Because God's word is sure. And what he says will happen. And has already happened in the past and will happen even more in the closer time. Why should you care? Because Christ himself is pleading at the door of your heart and my heart for admittance that he may come in to bring pardon and peace, but more, even more so, friends, in these days to bring lights, to bring knowledge, to bring the lights of the knowledge of the glory of God, which is Jesus himself. And friend, that light is the one leading us in the dark valley. Leading us in the dark valleys of this world today. Jesus' light is the light that's leading us to find knowledge in his word today. And friend, that knowledge is all you need to understand what is happening in the world right now to understand what happened in the world back then and understand how that will repeat itself before Christ's coming. What should you care? What should I care, friends? I want to finish off with this story. A striking illustration of the tyrannical character of this advocate of infallibility referring to the Roman Catholic Church. When he gave his treatments of the German Emperor Henry IV. For presuming to disregard the Pope's authority, this monarch was declared to be excommunicated and dethroned. Terrified by the desertion and, 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 and threats of his own princes who were encouraged in rebellion against him by the papal mandate. Henry felt the necessity of making peace with Rome in company with his wife and the humble and, and the faithful servants he crossed the, 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 the Alps in midwinter that he might humble himself before the Pope. Upon reaching the castle, Pope Gregory at the time had withdrawn and, and, and Harry was conducted with that his guards into an outer court and there in the severe cold of winter with uncovered head and naked feet and into and in a miserable dress he waited the pope's permission to come into his presence not until he had continued three days fasting and making confession did the pontiff con condescend to grant him pardon even then it was only upon condition that the emperor should wait the sanction of the Pope before resuming 
the insignia of exercising the power of royalty. And Gregory, the Pope, elated with this, with his triumph, boasting that it was his duty to pull down the pride of kings. Friends, I don't know about you, but when reading this story, I cannot see Christ in this man. I cannot see the, char the character of love, the character of mercy, the character of, of humility. I cannot see grace in this. But instead what I see is pride, anger, selfishness, merciless person, no grace at all. And friends, you judge, but as for me, I cannot see even Christ in this. I hope today you will make the decision to find the light in this dark world, to accept the light in this dark world, and to let the light guide your life in this dark world, that you may come to find the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Friends, that light is Jesus Christ himself. See you next time in the next chapter of this great controversy, The Wild Dances, as we come to see again where is Jesus in the next part of the Christian history. May God bless you and keep you. Hi there, Jonathan here from Voices in the Cities. I really hope you enjoyed this message. If you would like to dig more, check out the description right below. Don't forget to subscribe right here so that you don't miss out on any videos we post. And then if you want to watch more, what right up there, next video. See you next time.